a great pleasure uh, for me to, to welcome you today for this uh, new uh, game changer uh, lecture on, on earth science. And I will uh, briefly uh, introduce you. So uh, Miora uh, is uh, currently a program manager for Solid Earth Observation from space at the French Space Center, CNES. Uh, but uh, she is also conducting important research on the determination of the Earth's magnetic field uh, using ground measurement and satellite observation and also uh, on the, the interpretation of the magnetic field in terms of internal structure of the Earth. Uh, among uh, Miura's most important contribution in this domain, um, one can cite her work on the magnetic jerks. Jerks are very rapid change in the magnetic field generated by the Earth's core, and uh, you will certainly talk about that. Uh, for which uh, a topic for which you, she is considered as a the world specialist. Um, other contribution concerns slower vari variation of the magnetic fields, uh, field and the movement of the Earth's liquid core, allowing a better understanding of the origin of the Earth's dynamo, and uh, also on the processes of exchange of matter at the core mental interface by the combined analysis of magnetic and uh, gravity fields. Miora is also study, studying the magnetic field of uh, terrestrial planets, in particular Mars, Mars and uh, Mercury. And I am sure you will uh, talk about that also today. Miora serves as a general secretary of the European Geoscience Un Union, EGU, until 2016. And uh, recently, she was elected president of the International Association of uh, Geomagnetism and Aeronomy, uh, which is one of the eight associations of uh, IUGG, that is International Union of Geodesy and Geophysics. Uh, she received several prestigious awards, including the International Award of the American Geophysical Union and the Petrus Peregrinus Medal of the EGU. She is a member of the Romanian Academy of Science, a member of Academia Europaea, and uh, she is also a foreign member of the Royal Academy of Belgium and the Russian Academy of Science. And finally, uh, not finally, because there are many other things, but uh, uh, I just um, selected a few ones. Uh, she is currently PI, principal investigator uh, of a Deep Earth project. Uh, granted by ERC, that is the European Research Council, in the context of the Synergy Program of ERC. So, uh, Miura, the floor is yours, and uh, we are listening to you now for about yeah. 45 minutes. So, you have to share your screen, and uh, Willy, if you can start to, um, okay. to record. to do the recording, thank you. Okay, so uh, thank you, Annie. Uh, I really appreciate your kind introduction. Uh, so good afternoon or uh, good morning, or depending uh, where you are. Uh, thank you all for being uh, here. It's wonderful to see virtually, of course, so many friends uh, and dedicated community members uh, ready to hear about an attractive item, which is tonight the magnetic field. I would like to start by underlining that the results I'm going to present are based on studies realized with many of my colleagues and students and I would like, first of all, to thank uh, them named here or forgotten, and I'm sorry for this. So here is an outline of my talk. Uh, the talk uh, is, of course, a series of easy seminars. So it focuses on results obtained from space. However, I think it's very important to bring you on a journey in time and space and to move 
from compass time to more than satellite time. And I will give you here a few historical landmarks about the magnetic field. When we talk about magnetic field, of course, we talk about declination and about compass. It seems the compass was created around Qi dynasty and it pointed south. Long before it was used for navigation, the compass was actually used by fortunate tailors to make prediction. Indeed, these compasses at that time showed people the way, not literally, but figuratively, helping them to order their environments and their life. The very first uh, writing about the compass is from the beginning of the second millennia, written by Chen Kuo. He uh, describes the magnetic needle of compass, which would be useful uh, centuries after for navigation. He also pointed out that the magnetic needles are always the place slightly east rather than pointing to south. So it's really a very nice indication. Annie uh, told you that uh, I've been awarded with Petrus Peregrinus Medal. So of course I have to cite a little bit here Petrus Peregrinus. He wrote in 1269, Pistola de Magnete. And uh, this is really a landmark in the history of science. Petrus Peregrinus described two kinds of compass. One in which an uh, oval uh, um, uh, long stone floated on a bowl of water. And uh, the first dry compass here on which the needle is mounted on a pivot. He also was the first to write about experiments with magnetism and describe the laws of attraction. A few centuries after, William Gilbert, medicine of the Queen Elizabeth, wrote The Magnetic. This is an important book because on one side, it described many of his experiments with his model of the Earth's core, the Terela, and also he investigated the reason compasses point north. On the other side of the sea, in France, Le Notonier, a cartographer and geographer, wrote in 1601, Mécométrie de Léman. And it was a book written with Privilege de Roi. And it's very nice because I had the chance to have this book in my hands in this nice library you have behind me. And I found a very interesting map shown here where you can see the positions of magnetic poles here and theirs. And these positions are different from geographic poles. At the same time, it's a little bit more difficult to see. There is a trace of magnetic equator, which is different of uh, geographic equator. So uh, more than four centuries before, we had in our hands this notion about magnetic poles and uh, geographic poles. Of course, a question arises. Some 750 years after Petrus Peregrinus Epistola, we are still astonished by the magnetic field. And questions are like where, when to measure the magnetic field, how to measure it, how to interpret it, and maybe why to measure the magnetic field. To answer this very last question, I would like to start with a wonderful picture of the polar flights. Scott Kelly, a very famous NASA astronaut, wrote, I've never seen this before, this before red aurora, spectacular. And I think it is indeed spectacular. But we need to measure the magnetic field also for understanding the Earth's sun environment near Earth space and Earth's deep interior. Indeed, the magnetic field can be thought as a kind of huge cocoon protecting us from cosmic radiation and charged particles that bombard our planet in solar wind. Most of the field, something as 94%, is 
generated at depths greater than 3,000 kilometers by movement of molten iron in the outer core. The remaining 6% is partly due to electrical currents in space surrounding the Earth and partly to magnetized rocks in the upper lithosphere. But surprisingly, we are interested in uh, magnetic field also for understanding our nearby world. And it's very interesting to see that really recently, biologists if have identified a single protein without which birds probably would not be able to orient themselves using the geomagnetic field. Also, it was shown that sea turtles acquired the ability to explore magnetic information in a more complex way than hatchinglings using it as a component of navigation. Moreover, a possible link between gray whales um, starting and solar swarm storms uh, has been indicated, which may warrant further investigation into gray whales' abilities to sense geomagnetic field and much more uh, discussed in the community is the idea that maybe cattle seem to align with magnetic field lines. All this is nice, but what about us, human beings? Well, we in our uh, technological area, we are very much linked to navigation, radio, electric power, and satellite operations. And all this somehow uh, are influenced by the magnetic field. Here, what I'm showing in this graph is the variation over one day of three field component, horizontal component, vertical component, and total field. And it's easy to observe that there are very important changes in the field of, uh, in a very short period of time. Here, the records are from Chambon La Forêt Observatory in France. It's end of October uh, 2003 during the Halloween magnetic storm. And these very rapid variations of the magnetic field due to uh, phenomena on the sun surface and interactions between the sun and the earth could have important uh, consequences in navigation radio, electric power, and satellite operations. And you can imagine that in our days, satellites are really a very important component of our life. To sum up this part, I would like to say that measuring the magnetic field is really very important for fundamental science, but also for society-driven applications. And I didn't name here all of them. The magnetic field is a part of our planet and observing the Earth system dynamics, it's really important in our days with um, measurements at the Earth's surface or in space. So in the following, I would like to tell you a few words about measurements, ground observatories and space platforms. So in my talk, I'm interested only by direct measurements of the magnetic field. And these are not if we go back in time, not so uh, long in time. So declination are available since something is five century. It's just the angle between the north magnetic and the geographic north. Inclination four centuries, intensity two centuries. Magnetic observatories in uh, the sense of today of a networking of magnetic observatories provide magnetic data since some 100 years and satellite observations nearly continuously since something 20 years. And here I would like to share with you three nice pictures of three observatories, Surlari in Romania, Chambon La Forêt in France and Nimeg uh, in Germany, observatories where I spent part of my time just uh, measuring the magnetic field. These are very important places, of course, but there is a but. The magnetic observatories are 
even distributed at the Earth's surface. You can observe here that there is a clear difference between the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere, and of course, between land and oceans. This globally uneven distribution hampers the determination of a detailed global pattern of the geomagnetic field variations. To find this solution, we have to move to space. And in space, what we have, we have satellites. The very first satellite carrying instruments to measure the full magnetic field was Maxat, a satellite launched at the end of the 70s, and uh, it stays in space for seven months. And our community has to wait something as 20 years until the next satellite was launched, Orsted, in 1999. Orsted was planned for 14 months, but it was able to provide data over 14 years. So we were very happy. After Orsted, very successful CHAMS satellite, SACSI also, and mainly today, SWARM satellite, which is in fact three satellite mission launched in 2013. If you have a look on these pictures, you can observe immediately that all satellites are characterized by something special, and it's a boom. This is very important for a magnetic mission. You can see here a sketch of one of swarm satellites is a long and slimy body, something as nine meters, with the instruments on the top. Really on the tip, there is the absolute scalar magnetometer, and in the middle, an optical bench with a vector uh, magnetometer. It's uh, interesting to say that the absolute scalar magnetometer developed by Leti in France, and there is a CNES contribution to this mission. It's very important to validate, to calibrate the vector field measurements, but also it's possible to use this instrument, uh, an autonomous absolute vector field magnetometer, and it was a world first with this instrument. SWARM, so three satellites, as I've seen, a long way to have the mission. We start with studies uh, in 2000, thereafter with the development, the launch was in November 2013, and today we are so happy to have the data and to use them. As I told you, it's a constellation with two satellites side by side in a low orbit. It was 462 as the initial altitude, and one satellite here in a higher orbit at 511 initial altitude. Myself, I was happy to see these satellites before launch. So really, I'm happy to say they were here in front of me, and now they are up, and they provide data continuously. You can see that one day of data offered by a, a low Earth orbit satellite provide already a very good coverage. Let's have a look now how the data look like. Of course, the measurements are at Earth's surface in the observatories or in satellites, but we want to understand what's happened deep in the Earth at core mantle boundary and in the core. And for this, we need to have somehow this kind of signal. Here again, I use data from Chambon Lapore Observatory. On one side, monthly means, and on the other one, one mid values. Over 10 years, shown in this graph, we have the variations of the order of 500 nanoteslas. And you can see a slow variation in time. On the other hand, here, I plotted only 10 days with different amplitudes. And you can see clearly a daily variation of the magnetic field, which is linked to uh, phenomena in ionosphere. It's very important for us really to be able to separate in measurements we have the contribution from the core. How to do it? We have a mathematical tool. It's the possibility to describe the field in spherical harmonics. This is offer us a lot, a set of functions describing the internal part of the field, 
produced by the core and by the rocks uh, carrying a magnetic property in the lithosphere and by the external field. Due to MagSat uh, satellite, first of all, for the very first time, we were also able to make a difference between the contribution from the core and from the lithospheric field. You can see here a plot of the spectrum of the field, and we can see that for the large scales, in fact, up to degree order 14, the cord field uh, dominates. And for degrees higher than 14, the lithospheric field dominates. This offers us the possibility to have a distribution of the core field or of the lithospheric field at the Earth's surface. So let's have a look. Here it's the core field for three field components. North component, east component, and vertical on the left side, measured in nanoteslas, and on the right side, the secular variation, so the very first derivative in time, again for the three field uh, components. And we'll be very much interested by these variations and mainly by the vertical or radial component of the magnetic field. The lithospheric field. Of course, it's also important and uh, because we have satellite data is possible currently by putting together information from jump satellite, from swarm uh, missions, uh, from uh, aeromagnetic surveys or uh, 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 marine surveys to obtain this kind of very detailed description, uh, description of the lithospheric field up to degree or than 1100s. So really tens of kilometers of resolution. Here we can observe different anomalies. And one of them, for example, is Bangi anomaly. This is a place where the magnetic field is significantly sharper and stronger. The cause of this anomaly is still unknown, but some scientists speculate that it may be the result of a meteoric impact more than 514 million years ago. Now to put together, let's have a journey from the sun to the earth and to see how the earth magnetic field looks like. So here is the sun and we are approaching the earth and you can see that the magnetic field around the earth has this elongated fall in the direction opposite to the sun. This is because of the interaction of the magnetic field of the Earth itself and the solar wind. Approaching our planet, the field becomes more and more dipolar. And you can see here the dipolar features of the magnetic field with these differences between uh, uh, one part and the other. Now, of course, this very simple situation becomes more complicated if we go down to the core mental boundary where the field is more complicated, as I said. You can see that this dipolar structure uh, becomes a more complicated one. Uh, the magnetic equator uh, is more complicated and there are reverse patches on one side and on the other side. And if we have a look on uh, the crustal or lithospheric field, we can see, for example, here uh, a succession of uh, anomalies, uh, positive and negative anomalies, for example, here in the North Atlantic, and they are linked to uh, the spreading of uh, the ocean over uh, geological times. We, with this, I move on to the next part of my talk. And here, in fact, I would like to focus on uh, uh, measurements presenting theory. So I will start with geomagnetic jerks and core dynamics, uh, a subject I really enjoy. But this subject has a history. And the history started in Chambon Laforet Observatory when I start to put together uh, declination measurements obtained in Paris region. 
the very first one in 1541, and you can observe here that the variations over four centuries are really important for something as plus 10 degrees to minus 23 degrees. So the declination decreased until 1800s and thereafter increased. This epoch, you for sure know, it's the time of French Revolution, but there is no link between French Revolution and changes in magnetic field. More important is to see something else, that if we compute the very first time derivative of the field, uh, indeed the secular variation, we observe these changes, the V-shape changes, and these are known as geomagnetic jerks. First of all, we have observatory data to analyze these um, events. Uh, these are uh, important uh, phenomena links to what's happened in the core. And uh, you can see here a small part of studies dedicated to geomagnetic jerks, maybe only one tenth. Why it's so important? Because, for example, if we look only at two observatories, Chambon La Forêt and in France and Nimic in Germany, separated by less than 1,000 kilometers, we observe, for example, for one period, a clear similitude between the two secular variations, but thereafter we can observe some differences in the amplitude between the two places. We are also interested to investigate the secular acceleration uh, of the field. The problem with the observatory is again, they're uneven in distribution. So if we want to have a full description of the field, we need uh, to approach this problem in a different way. And it's what we realized by defined the concept of virtual observatories. These observatories are not at all proper observatories. They are only well-defined position in space useful for studies of long-term field variations. And here you can see the variation for three components, X, Y, and Z, for three observatories, Hermanus in South Africa, Kakioka in Japan, and Nimek in Germany. And we can observe a good similarity in variations between the ground observations and space observations. This concept has been developed and used in many studies. And there are lots of advantages of this. First of all, the fact that we can obtain high temporal resolution and uniform global coverage. If we use together CHAMP and SWARM data, we can obtain series of data over more than two decades. And we observe again a very good correlation between observation on ground in space. And in this study, you observe a comparison between three observatories again, Honolulu, Hermanus, and Kakioka. In black points, there is a measurement in the observatory, monthly means. In red, the virtual observatories with a gap between CHAMP and SWORD. And in green, a model built. And we observe again a good correlation between ground real observations and virtual observatory. So these are the data, these are the observation. And the question is, which is the mechanism behind these jerks, behind this observation? For this, let's go back to our description of the field. Here again, the radial component of the magnetic field of the Earth's surface. It looks nicely, it's a dipolar field. And what's happened at the core mental boundary? The image is completely different. You see the geomagnetic equator here becomes really much more complicated. We can see these reverse patches in one hemisphere and the other one. We are able to do uh, this because we do a downward continuation. And for this, we need to assume that there are no current sources in the mantle, so between the surface and core mantle boundary. So we 
can continue the field and he, it, it can be described by a potential. We can do the same with the secular variation of the field here at the surface and here at the core mental boundary. What we observe immediately is that in Atlantic uh, hemisphere, uh, the secular variation is much more dynamic. And uh, if we compare with Pacific hemisphere, uh, we observe that it's really uh, quieter. Now with these two inputs, we can play with induction equation. And one possible interpretation of observed secular variation is in terms of rotation dominated or passageostrophic flow of the liquid matter in the outer core. We can estimate these flows, uh, supposing that there is no uh, dissipation on the time scales we are interested in. And it's possible to have the flow patterns at the core mental boundary. Here is an animation obtained uh, from satellite data, Champ and Swarm. It's this uh, uh, flow, it's a quasi-geostrophic flow, and it's based on high quality satellite data. The magnetic field is computed up to degree order 13 and the secular variation up to degree order 16. The blue orange uh, background is a secular variation here expressed in micro Tesla per year and the speed, the motion, it's uh, expressed in kilometers per year. So of the order of 20, 30 kilometers per year. What is possible to observe is that there are regions of intense radial secular variation at the core surface in a broadband around the equator, something as 30 degrees on one side, on the other side, but also that there are well located some negative, positive, negative series of patches of radial secular variation under uh, Alaska and Siberia. And uh, this appears to be connected uh, with very rapid westward motion of uh, this uh, high uh, latitudes. To interpret this, we can imagine different processes at the core mental boundary or in the core for example, a process as dissolution crystallization of the core mental boundary, map waves in the liquid core, or uh, moving blobs or waves to explain jerks in the core. To sum up this part, I would like to say that we are really interested to analyze the geomagnetic jerks on two different scales, on long scales using uh, observatory data, or some long series of declination data as here shown for Munich uh, series with variation uh, of uh, declination and secular uh, acceleration on, on the other side. And uh, also on very short time scales with less well-defined events obtained from satellite data, they are seen mainly in secular acceleration and they are probably linked to the geomagnetic forces. So to thoughts, some thoughts to take home, uh, I think the geomagnetic jerks concept should be considered as more general one and we have to think about the memory of the process. Now I would like to tell you something not only magnetic but also gravity. And uh, it's interesting to see that these two fields could help us to uh, understand the irregularity of the core mental boundary. So the story here started also in Paris when I have in my office magnetic and gravity maps. And you can think, well, this is just a decoration. Well, not really, because it was also inspiration. So this offers us the possibility to go through understanding better these anomalies and maybe to provide a new window into the core dynamics. Our work starts again with virtual magnetic observatories for magnetic and for gravity data. 
we were really very uh, lucky to have uh, magnetic data offered by CHAMP satellite from 2002 to 2010, but also gravity data provided by GRACE mission. So these two missions measuring magnetic field and gravity field with very high accuracy provide us the possibility to compute series of uh, gravity field and magnetic acceleration of the field over uh, this period of time and in this position of magnetic virtual and gravity virtual observatories. What we observe is that there is a zone here in South Atlantic African region, and it seems that it's a very it's a good correlation in between the two series. Of course, we needed to push our study and to apply some SVD decomposition for magnetic and gravity time series. And if you have a look, first of all, to the right panels, it's possible to see the special patterns for magnetic and gravity data, and they look pretty much the same. And more interesting is to see the variation in time for gravity data on one side and for magnetic acceleration uh, here in Atmo Tesla per square years. And important is to have this order of magnitude. So on one side for uh, secular acceleration, something is plus minus 13 nanotesla per square year. And for the gravity, something around minus plus 400 nanogas. So again, the question is which mechanism? And to find it, just another inspiration from the Earth's surface. Of course, the Earth's surface is changing a lot uh, under uh, different factors as climate, surface processes, tectonic processes. And we say, okay, maybe it's the same as the core mental boundary. We have not to consider this boundary as a smooth boundary, but to consider as a boundary where we deal with uh, dynamic topography. To explain these changes, we uh, generated a process of dissolution redeposition, and this is done via a model by built on the cellular, cellular automaton. In fact, what is done here is to consider uh, the transition between dissolution, crystallization, and diffusion of elements on one side from the mantle, which is solid, the silicates of the mantle, and on the other side from uh, the fluid core, which could be saturated or unsaturated. The transition between these states are associated with a set of double transitions, and these transitions ensure conservation of mass. Here we, oh, sorry. Okay, uh, here we only show the transition along a given direction. But if we take the three uh, D case, there are six times more transitions. And the transition rates, in fact, indicates the characteristic time scales of the model. I don't want to go more in detail, just only to say that if here it's what the CMB looks like at a large scale, we can focus on a zoom of this vertical scale and this uh, solid liquid interface at core mental boundary is defined as a per collision front between the giant cluster of silicates cells on the top and the giant cluster of liquid iron cells in the bottom. Thus, we can identify and precisely locate here in green the compositional boundary uh, with abrupt changes, and this is um, under the control of the density. This model uh, of changes between core and uh, the mantle in time uh, have an, uh, consequences in the measured magnetic field of the Earth's surface. And it's possible to consider these changes in the topography and 
to have the effect on the magnetic uh, field and the gravity field and to compute. If you put all together in this graph, which is at the same time simple and complicated, uh, remember, uh, we said that we have variation in the magnetic anomaly in secular acceleration of the order plus minus 30 nanotesla per year, per square years, and something around 500 nanogals for gravity anomaly. And if we compute magnetic and gravity anomalies with respect of the changes in amplitude of the CMB topography for very large scales, we obtain similar values. So what is important here as so to take home is that there is an agreement at the core mental boundary uh, between observed changes via satellite data and predicted by cellular autonomous model for magnetic and gravimetric models. The values indicated here are changes in the amplitude of the CMB of something as 30 centimeters with a rate of change in elevation as something of the order of centimeters per year. And of course, we can think it's nothing. It's indeed very small, but it's for the planetary scale. And it's also with huge change in the density on one side, on the other side of the core mental boundary. Up to now, I show you this correlation between the magnetic and gravity field. And here it's a very recent results with more data we use. And again, we see this correlation. However, there is another important term to be considered and is Earth rotation, which is expressed by length of the day. The decadal oscillation of the length of the day are attributed to variation of the core angular momentum deduced from observation of the magnetic field. In this graph, I plotted a wavelet analysis of length of the day, and it's possible to see a clear variation of the period at nearly six years, uh, having a core origin, and another one at 8.6 6 years, which is under um, investigation. So what is important is somehow to get the big picture of everything, so magnetic and gravity fields and Earth rotation. And we were very uh, happy to be granted with a graceful project, which deals with probing the deep Earth interior by synergistic use of observation of the magnetic and gravity fields and of the Earth rotation. Uh, grant with Veronique de Aunt at the Royal Observatory of Belgium and Dani Kaznav introduced me here. So I very much hope that during this uh, project we will obtain very nice results and we will share them uh, with you. Now I am nearly at the end of my talk with some conclusions. And the, my very first conclusion is that I was not able to tell you so many things I wanted to tell. So first of all, uh, one small point about uh, geomagnetic possible signals before earthquakes. We have been interested by this question um, years ago uh, after Sumatra big earthquake in 2004. And we were able to find some signatures of these earthquakes and the tsunami related with in uh, geomagnetic chunk data. But we were able also uh, to detect at the same period of time, because we analyzed data before and after the earthquake, the signature of a giant flare, uh, which uh, occurred on 27 of uh, December. It was a magnetar which erupted and this event generated a huge burst of gamma ray that were spotted around and we observe these pulsations of a very clear period in CHAMP data. We had swarm data and 
an earthquake, unfortunately, in 2015, April 25th. And uh, this was a large earthquake occurring in Nepal, Himalaya. And what we did here, we compare the cumulative number of earthquakes with magnitudes higher than four with cumulative number of magnetic anomalies. And here before the earthquake and after you can see similar behavior in what it's observed from data related to the earthquake with what we observe from magnetic anomalies. So here the thought is the lithosphere, atmosphere, ionosphere, coupling extends over a large time interval and maybe the space will bring us also a crucial information in understanding these uh, events. One single plot here with many other things about the Earth's magnetic field. Of course, the dipole, since we have uh, vector field measurements, we are able to plot the uh, decay of the dipole and we can see that uh, the field change dipolar form by something as 5% per century. Also important because of availability of space data is to see the rate of change of the field intensity plotted here. Mainly in South African uh, region, there are changes up to 12% of the value of the field. And this is very important when we think that it's a characteristic of a planet. The magnetic pulse velocities, the two geomagnetic poles have different lives. The North magnetic pole accelerates since the uh, 17th, and uh, today it moves uh, clearly from Canada to, to Siberia. The South magnetic pole, which is not plotted here, it's staying of uh, velocity of the order of only 5-10 kilometers per year, comparing with something as 50 kilometers per year for North Magnetic Pole. And the last but not the least, the South Atlantic Anomaly. Currently, the South Atlantic Anomaly could be called South America South Atlantic Anomaly because this anomaly where the intensity of the field is weaker and weaker, uh, it spent a larger part and it's moving from South Atlantic to uh, South American uh, continent. So all these are interesting features of the magnetic field and we are very happy to have uh, satellite data in order to investigate them and to see these very rapid changes of the field mainly from the core which were not possible to be investigated only with data from magnetic observatories. Now, my final thought is to bring you a little bit far away, and I will start with Mercury. Here is a Mercury magnetic field. We know about Mercury that it has a dynamo. Uh, Messenger was a mission uh, which brought us lots of information about Mercury. Baby Colombo is an ESA uh, JAXA. Uh, mission started in 2018, will arrive around Mercury in 2025, and I'm happy to be a copy eye from an instrument. And the last is Mars. Mars, it's a mission, uh, it's a um, body, uh, also very interesting from magnetic point of view. Uh, the dynamo on Mars stopped 3.5, 3.7 uh, billion years ago. There is a clear dichotomy between the northern and south hemisphere of Mars, but there are very strong crustal fields well observed in some areas at the Mars surface. And why I wanted to finish with Mars? Because today it's the day, you know for sure, that tonight at uh, 21.55 uh, Central European time, Perseverance will uh, set down on Jezero crater. This is an impact crater of something as 45 kilometer wide. The crater is home to an ancient river delta that flowed 3.5 billion years ago into a lake. So it's a very appropriate place 
which offers the prospect of collecting samples of a varied range of rocks and minerals, and in particular carbonates, which can preserve fossil traces of past life. Perseverance has seven instruments on board, also a sample collection and catching system. One of the instruments, it's a French instrument, and we are really uh, very proud and emotional to see the instrument arriving on Mars. And the Perseverance will be not alone, will be also um, set down an experimental helicopter called the Ingenuity on the surface of the red planet. So next uh, rendezvous, it's uh, in a couple of hours, uh, not on the Earth, but on Mars. And to finish with, I would like to thank the Earth's magnetic field for water that gives us life. Recently, it was uh, shown that planetary magnetism is an important factor when prioritizing observations of potentially habitable planets. And here I'm thinking, of course, of about exoplanets. And of course, I would like to thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Miawara, for this uh, beautiful uh, lecture, very interesting, a lot of information. So now we have time for uh, questions. Uh, so there are two possibilities for the participants. Uh, either you raise your hand and um, uh, you will be allowed to talk and ask uh, your question to, to Miora, or you write your question, your question in the chat. So I have already seen uh, several questions in, in, in the chat. So Miara, so waiting for other uh, uh, questions or people raising their, their hand. Uh, one a very first question I saw is, uh, uh, can you comment a little more about the uh, diurnal, diurnal variation? Uh, you said okay. it, 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 it has its origin in the ionosphere, yes, but yes. Uh, can you explain why? Okay, so uh, diurnal variation is uh, something we we clearly observe in the observatories, and, and in fact, what's happened on one side, you, you have the, the sun, uh, the sun is producing currents, and the ionosphere on the side uh, on the side uh, on the day side, and uh, uh, these uh, variations are generally very smooth, as you have seen in this. Uh, uh, representation. And uh, uh, on the other side, on the night side, these currents are not here because we have not this interaction between the sun and, uh, and the earth. So uh, the diurnal variation is uh, very well uh, known and uh, it's understood uh, uh, for a while just because of this current flowing in the ionosphere. Okay, I, I see several other questions in the chat, but also people are, uh, have uh, raised their hand. So in the chat, I, the, the question, one question is about uh, geomagnetic uh, reversals. Can you um, comment a little more about that? Uh, yes, of course. Um... Uh, I didn't uh, approach this uh, subject here uh, during my, uh, my talk. Uh, of course, it's very important to understand why the magnetic uh, uh, field flip. And um, what's happened, in fact, is that it's a process we observe mainly uh, from paleomagnetic uh, data. The very last uh, reversal was in something as 780,000 uh, 780, years ago. And uh, uh, the North Pole is transformed into the South Pole as the South Pole becomes the North Pole. What's happened is that we cannot say that uh, uh, the geomagnetic field disappears completely. In between, we also observe something called excursion that is not a real reversal. It's only the fact that there is a decrease in the overall strength of the magnetic field. And uh, 
uh, this is uh, for, for uh, this is clearly also observed. Um, of course, there is a question how long uh, uh, reversal, uh, uh, how long, uh, how much time uh, we need for uh, reversals. Uh, it seems that it's of the order that 1,000, 2,000 uh, years in order to, to reverse. And during this process, we think that mainly it's the dipole part which completely uh, changed from one side to another side, but there are the other parts of the field still uh, remaining. Thank you. Um, there is one question from uh, Delado Marchetti. I don't know if uh, my pronunciation is OK. Uh, it's about the influence of the gravity field on, on the swarm satellites. Uh, well, the, the gravity field, it's uh, around for all, all satellites. Uh, swarm uh, does not measure the uh, the, the gravity field is not dedicated for it. Um, uh, what we have uh, currently is uh, uh, graceful on satellite, which is completely dedicated to, to the gravity field. Um, uh, maybe I was not able to understand completely. Uh, this, is, this is a question. It's okay. But, but, but uh, for, the, for the, just for magnetic field. Yes. You, you have another question, uh, which is, what is a gravity anomaly? Ah, well, what, what I, uh, well, here it's, uh, it's very complicated and I had no time really to go into uh, very much details. You, you know that uh, for the gravity, the signals I show here, it's not very easy to, uh, to, to observe because it's a very small uh, signal. Gravity in satellite data mainly uh, has influenced by uh, anomalies linked to some other mass circulations, which are, for example, in atmosphere or in oceans or in hydrology. And uh, in order to observe these very tiny signals, we suppose are connected with the core, we uh, consider the grace or graceful on data and we try to subtract uh, the gravity uh, signal produced by these other uh, mass changes. So from atmosphere, oceans and hydrology. And only the, thereafter we have this thin signal. Um, the magnetic field as the gravity field are complicated and uh, there are many sources in one single measurement. So there is somehow an art in order to be able to extract the signal we are interested in. Thank you, Mura. Another question is, uh, what do you think will be the future of geomagnetic observatories in the frame of the uh, amazing satellite era. Uh, this is a question from Anka Isaac uh, from uh, from uh, the Solar Solari Geomagnetic Observatory in Romania. Yeah, Maybe you know this you. person. <laughs> okay. Uh, yes, of course we uh, we can interrogate about the role of geomagnetic observatories when we have satellites and mainly continuous uh, satellite observations. Uh, we have seen the satellites are able to provide continuous measurements and very good coverage, so lots of advantages. However, something is very important, and I had no time to indicate in, in my talk, is that the satellites generally are at four, five hundred uh, kilometers altitude, and in between the satellite and the Earth, there is an ionosphere. So when we do the separation between different parts of the field, one observatory will see the ionosphere as an external field. And the satellite will see the ionosphere as an internal field. And these two help us a lot in better defining the different contributions. So I think uh, you have not to be afraid. I'm sure that the magnetic observatories 
which started in 19th century, so we continue in 21st century because we need ground data, uh, not only uh, to compare with the satellite data, but also for all other uh, studies and mainly, for example, to, to produce uh, uh, magnetic indices or uh, to do this comparison between um, ground and uh, satellite uh, altitude and also to, um, uh, to define this uh, very intriguing uh, region, which is ionosphere, and which is important also to, to be better understood. Uh, another question is about the future of satellite mission beyond SWAL. Yes, this is a very important also uh, question because uh, today SWARM is still in orbit. Uh, we very much hope that SWARM will stay longer, uh, mainly the satellite at the higher altitude. However, we need to think what it will be next. And the uh, next currently is a very interesting project carried out uh, by uh, EPGP in Paris, in France, and uh, Leti. Uh, with some other uh, support from uh, European community, and it's nano maxat. So the idea behind is to build a nano uh, satellite as a prototype, and thereafter to have a kind of networking of nano satellites, and to measure continuously the magnetic field. There are so many important consequences of not having. Um, magnetic measurement from space that indeed we have to do uh, everything we can in order to have a successful mission. And today NanoMaxad it's uh, somehow developing in the framework SCOOT ESA missions and I very much hope that uh, will go on. We had the phase A but we are waiting just these days for a decision to push this mission as a one. Okay, um, you're right, you have a lot of questions. So <laughs> okay. the next one is uh, about the detectability of magnetic fields induced by ocean currents. Okay, this also is something I, I didn't point out. Of course, there is a signal of the uh, ocean in magnetic data. What you have to think is that uh, the ocean is what? It's salty water moving in a magnetic field. So of course it's producing uh, an induced magnetic field. It's not very important. It's of the order of some nano Tesla, but it's possible to have the signature of uh, the ocean currents and uh, tides in the satellite data. And a few studies uh, were uh, uh, devoted to uh, this uh, subject. So yes, there is a signature of ocean. Okay, uh, the next question is, uh, is uh, geomagnetism fluctuation influencing human behavior? Oh, this is a very good <laughs> question. <laughs> well, it's, it's a good question because of course we uh, we have to to think which is uh, uh, our interaction with this field and with changes in the magnetic field and uh, uh, a few studies have been realized by some some scientists with respect of uh, the behavior of the human being mainly during the magnetic storms um, myself, I, I, I didn't uh, address the subject, but from what I read, it seems that during these magnetic storms, uh, humans are much more sensitive, uh, mainly with respect of, uh, of ophthalmological issues or maybe the skin issues. And uh, one important thing we have not to forget is for uh, people in space, so you know very well that uh, uh, astronauts on uh, the International Space Station uh, during uh, the geomagnetic storms, for example, they are not allowed to go out in space just in order to be protected from these huge radiation effects. Thank you. Uh, a question about CubeSat uh, ge geomagnetic satellite mission. 
Uh, I suppose this is a question with respect to uh, the satellite mission uh, launched by uh, University of Versailles. If it's, uh, this indeed, uh, it was a good start uh, set this space uh, a couple of weeks ago. It's uh, a good uh, mission and I'm happy to say that uh, I was able to see one of the very first map of uh, magnetic field intensity. Uh, and uh, at the very first glance, it's, uh, it's a good result. Of course, we have to investigate a little bit more. And uh, this CubeSat mission or NanoMaxSat idea of missions are very uh, novel and very important missions. And I think it's really uh, the future in measuring continuously the magnetic field from space. Uh, there is a question of, uh, um, about uh, the use, the usefulness of uh, historical uh, observation of the magnetic field made from old sailing ships. I don't know if you, ah, yes, you think it is uh, uh, useful uh, for, for yeah, 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 uh, for it, science. Yes, it's it's very very important because you you have to think that. Uh, during the centuries of navigation, uh, we had not so many information on land, and mainly the information uh, on declination and on inclination uh, came from uh, this uh, uh, ocean uh, uh, navigation uh, uh, data. Uh, in fact, uh, the models of uh, geomagnetic field uh, today covers the period from 1590 through nowadays. And over all these centuries, it's possible to have this data just because of this uh, expedition uh, we know over the history. Uh, what is a little bit difficult, and I had the chance to work with this data also, is that, of course, at that time, uh, uh, the information about the declination were with respect of uh, the starting point. So every single time you have to go back to the logs of uh, sellers and to well define the position for the starting of the vessel in order to be sure you are on the right uh, longitude. But these are very, very important information. And sometimes you have to go in very nice places as this library and to, to go back in uh, old books and to find the uh, declination values. Thank you. Uh, next question is about uh, uh, the use of uh, magnetic variations, the detection of magnetic uh, variation uh, before earthquakes. So can this kind of uh, data be used uh, to predict earthquakes? Miora? Miora, we don't hear, we cannot uh, hear you anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a problem. Apparently, we don't hear Miora anymore. Um, Tilman or Willy, uh, can you hear me? Yes, I hear you well. I but uh, Miora has disappeared. Well, yes, we can have a look if she comes back in some... Yes, session. otherwise we will close uh, the session. And there are, there are you... many other questions, so... If, if, uh, if there are three raised hands in the... Yes, exactly. Yeah. But uh, if Mora is gone, yeah. I don't know what we can do. So maybe uh, we can look at the questions and uh, I propose that uh, we you, you, you send your question to Miora. Yes, yes, there are three questions. Uh, JPL in the US. 
and it will be uh, on mass redistribution in the Earth system uh, from space gravimetry of um, the GRACE and the GRACE follow-on mission. So thanks to all of you. Uh, bye bye, and uh, it's very.